just keep coming. This morning we have uh, we have a special treat. We have um, is it Doctor Doctor Steele? Uh, Dr. Steele, who's from Kenya, he'll tell you about his ministry and where he serves and his wife as well and her service. Um, so anyway, it is a joy to have them. Uh, I was you know, blessed by the Lord speaking through him this, t this morning through preaching. So it was, uh, we thank you for the gift uh, that you are to us. But uh, we, we will begin uh, with prayer. Lord, we give thanks to you for you are good and your mercy endures forever. We thank you that we are yours, the sheep of your pasture, that you've given us through holy baptism, your very name. So we ask that you be with us as we hear about the work that you're doing to call and gather people to yourself, to strengthen and build up your church and to train pastors both here but all over the world, including in Kenya. So be with Dr. Steele as he speaks to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I am uh, Reverend Dr. Walter Steele, my wife, Robin. Um, we are, uh, are, before the call to come to the mission field, uh, I was a pastor at Resurrection Lutheran Church in Quartz Hill, California, which sits between Lancaster and Palmdale, if that means anything to anybody, uh, in that area. Um, and so we've been on the mission field uh, for about three and a half years so far. I have a few connections back to this congregation that a couple people uh, don't know. One thing is your former pastor, Pastor uh, Peppercorn, uh, I knew from back in seminary, and we have uh, known each other for many, many years. Uh, when uh, Robin's from Albuquerque, and when we go to Albuquerque, we would go to Grace Lutheran, which is where he was pastor. Um, uh, but the first time I went there, he was not there. The next time I go there, he's supposed to be there, but he got COVID. So I didn't, my wife has met him, but I had not before today. Um, but then also on top of that, um, we decided in our congregation to have a women's a retreat because the Baptists were having all these women's retreats. And I, said, well, I can't live for it. You didn't tell me that. I, so I got a hold of a professor, professor Arthur Just, and I said, you know, who would you recommend as a really good teacher? And he said, I know just the person, and it's Pamela. Uh, so Pamela was our first speaker at one of our conferences, and, uh, and then that has developed a relationship. Uh, then we find out, well, she's in love with Kenya. Um, and uh, all the work that she's doing there. So when she comes into town, we, we get together and uh, splurge on some Western food at a, at a coffee spot. They graciously pick me up and save me from hotel food and we go to Java House. Java House! <laughs> <laughs> Where you can actually get a chocolate milkshake if you want. Yeah. Which is actually pretty good. So there is, Kenya's not exactly the Kenya everybody expects. <laughs> but, um, and we, uh, we've been serving in Kenya uh, since the call came in 2019, um, and then in 2020 is actually when we deployed. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about that story uh, there. Um, but uh, when we do, uh, I just kind of like to start off with a little bit of an introduction to some of the cultural things that are there. And one of them is uh, when we go out to the congregations, the singing, of course, is always a big part of any Lutheran church. And uh, these are some of the children at one of the congregations in uh, the town of Song, North, actually, way up in the hills from Songdu, um, where they are singing. And uh, Deaconess Josephine is part of this. If you know, you know Josephine. Uh, and you'll see on this, this congregation has no electricity at all. So they use a drum to keep the, the beat of the music. Um, Now what they're singing is, what they're singing for a minute is that basically Jesus loves me when I, when I sleep. He has washed me clean and so that I am safe when I awake. So 
one song, watch the kids singing like this. Now here's a completely different style of music. This is down in Shinyanga, Tanzania. Um, now these are deaconess and pastoral students who are gathered together for a course that I was teaching. Um, and this is just before their chapel, and they just start singing. But you'll notice a very different kind of music as well. So there's a lot of variation in the music. Um, and I think this one is just absolutely beautiful. Now, uh, we, uh, I put Tanzania on the screen first because we flew into Nairobi and we can't even remember our first stop in Nairobi. It was so crazy uh, getting ready to repack all our suitcases and head down uh, to Tanzania for Swahili Language School. Now, uh, I'll use it on this screen. Oh, does it show up really well? You can see the little red dot, right? Yep. You know what this is for? Driving cats crazy. Okay. <laughs> uh, here's Kenya, this is Tanzania, and uh, where we were, was, again, we flew into Nairobi, they flew us to Dar es Salaam, one of the capitals, two capitals in the country, and then down to Iringa, this small town down here, uh, where we were for Swahili Language School, mm. and Swahili Language School runs for um, 12 weeks. It's an intensive time to learn the language. Uh, now, the reason for that is in Kenya, you have 47 <laughs> different tribal groups, 47 really different tribal languages, and it's been estimated about 140 some odd dialects within there. Um, there are two uh, official languages, if you will. Uh, the official language of Kenya is English. Kenya was a British colony before the end of the colonial era and um, all the documents and things that we sign, all the official signage and things tend to be in English. Um, Swahili is a language that grew on the continent as a trading language really between the Arab traders and the peoples um, and developed over time and has a lot of Arab loan words as well. So for those of us who know Hebrew, some of it's easy and sometimes that can confuse you even more. Um, but that is the uh, national language of Kenya. For Tanzania, Swahili is the national official language, but English is increasingly being used, especially in higher education, as these countries are wanting to become part of the world community. So you'll find a lot of that. So I do teach in English, even though my students, uh, some speak Swahili, but a lot of my students don't because of the 47 different tribal groups. For some, English is easier for them to speak, even in Kenya, than is Swahili. Uh, in fact, one of our professors there, uh, who is a Luo, says Swahili doesn't form well in my mouth. English is an easier language for him to speak. Kind of like French, it doesn't form at all in my mouth. <laughs> well, we got there during the rainy season. Uh, this platform I'm standing on is supposed to be about uh, two meters above the water levels. Uh, obviously it's not, and we have a picnic table over here that we enjoyed, but we're not sure how it got there. <laughs> All right, so it was the rainy season. Uh, the seasons in uh, East Africa tend to be long rains, dry, short rains, dry. Uh, and temperatures usually in the high 70s up to the high 80s, into the 90s some days. Huh? By the lake, it gets that hot. By the lake, it gets that hot, too. It might get even hotter than that by the lake. So we've, um, but we're about 11 miles, in Kenya, we're about 11 miles south of the equator. But we're at 5,000 feet, so our, our, we tend to be nice and moderate where we live. Um, but finally, the waters did calm down. And, um, but we're in, while we were at language school, well, I'll tell you the story about that a little bit later. 
Uh, so the waters did calm down. <laughs> when you got to get to my suit, well, you. That platform that the zip line went to was what was underwater. Oh, yeah. wow. What I was there. So it gives you an idea of how much water we had that time. Uh, so we were there for language school. This is a Tungku. Tungku is our uh, Swahili language instructor. Now, Swa he's an interesting man to get to know because Tungku is a secular Muslim. Hmm? What's a secular Muslim? I mean, you know, mosque, Christ, uh, church on Sunday, you know, the rest of the week. Well, mosque on Friday, and then there's the rest of the week. Uh, and Tunku has been working, teaching Swahili to missionaries for many, many years. So many of us have had the chance to share the faith with them. Somehow the Lord has not yet granted him to come to the faith, but he was nonetheless not only a very good language instructor, but at the same time, he gave us some real good insights into the culture, especially the ways in which often the, the Christian faith or Islam as seen as a thing for the day of worship, but the rest of the week, you're back into the traditional African religion, affecting the way you live. But then again, like I said in the sermon for those who are there this morning, I'm not so dumb as to think that many of my people didn't live like pagans on Wednesday. Okay, yeah. uh, so depends on where you are, how you there is the faith is taken. So we, we're, lang we're, language, uh, we're learning some Swahili uh, while we were there. Um, and uh, just a little bit of a Swahili lesson I thought would be fun. Um, here's some common words in Swahili. Um, let's see if we can guess them. Baba? Baby. baby. Nah, not Baba. baby. Father. 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 Someone else the other day was really smart. They said, I figured it out because it came afterwards. <laughs> Mama means? Mama. Mama. Car. No, no, not really. <laughs> Kaka? Poop. <laughs> brother. brother. Try that on your what? brother. <laughs> Dada. Sister. Daddy. Sister. Now, if you meant, if your child said to you, da da, <laughs> you thought they were talking to you? Right. Probably not. No, da da is sister. Jirani means neighbor and Rafiki means friend. So uh, we were working on our language and things like this. But about five weeks into language school, this virus came across into Africa. And we spent seven months in, in Tanzania. Um, but we kept working on the language. I got to meet my instructor by WhatsApp, <laughs> which is not very effective. Um, but we did continue to work on our language work. These are Robin's vocabulary cards. She likes vocabulary cards. And here I am working on translating the Bible into Swahili, doing some uh, of the language work like that. So we, we kept at it. You'll also notice that when you're seven months trapped out, you know, around uh, nowhere, you need a barber badly. badly. Okay. But we finally got a chance to get to Kenya. This is the Kenyan flag uh, with the shield that really represents, of course, the most famous tribe among the Kenyans, which is the Maasai. Maasai. Uh, and this is the Kenyan flag. Now, again, we are located, here's Kenya. And this gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the students that I teach. About half of the students at Nama Lutheran College, where I am an instructor or a professor, are from Kenya. The other half come from the countries in the area, including Ethiopia, South Sudan. We have had students from Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, Malawi, and Zambia. So we have really an international group of students from the East Africa region. Um, again, which is part of the reason why um, we are uh, where we are, uh, kind of in the center of all those countries. Um, oh, there we go. This is, this is a, a close-up map of Kenya. The capital is Nairobi. Mombasa is the second largest city and their port city. Little uh, piece of trivia. Africa is the second largest continent after Asia. 
It is the continent with the least amount of shoreline. <laughs> Europe has more, really? and it's the tiniest. Well, just think of Finland, <laughs> Ireland, all the inlets. Africa's coast is basically, with, it only has the Nile in the Gambia um, as actually li rivers that flow out of the continent. Um, is also a very shallow continental shelf and the, um, they just don't have the inlets that most continents do, which explains part of why Africans never became a seafaring people. Um, they stuck more to the rivers and they were blessed with a number of very large lakes in the center of the country, including Lake Victoria. So Kenya is surrounded with Somalia to the east, Ethiopia to the north, and some of South Sudan, Uganda to the west, and Tanzania to the south, and they get this itty bitty part of Lake Victoria, which is actually a very, very large lake. This is Kisumu, and Kisumu is where Pamela flies into all the time. You go to Nairobi first, into Nairobi, and then you fly into Kisumu, and then about an hour away from there, um, by a very good road now, um, is where we are, about 5,000 foot elevation, <laughs> up what's called the Kisumu Highlands. Um, and then your, uh, just a little past that is where Rehema uh, is that Pamela's been working on. So we're very close to one another when she comes into town in this area, uh, which, is always, which is always a joy. So where I serve is at Nema Lutheran College. Nema is the Swahili word for grace. And this is our home uh, that we live in, known as Karibuni House. Karibu means welcome, and Karibuni means y'all welcome. It's a Texas word. <laughs> <laughs> These are some of our friends. This is uh, some of the men. Our house needed some work, so they were helping do some work around it. This is a good friend of ours, Charles, uh, who's been a friend of missionaries for the longest time. Uh, those that know Charlie Fro and Jan Fro, they lived in this house too, okay, before. Uh, so it's a very well-known missionary house. But can anybody guess what this is? It's a step ladder. Oh, and you need one, you no. build it. Oh. I know some people thought, oh, that's for tomatoes. No, that's <laughs> not for tomatoes. <laughs> Put that in the kitchen and you know, use your step ladder. Yeah, yeah. outside step ladder. <laughs> A high step. A high step, very high step. These are some of our students that we uh, had the first time we got there. Um, it, again, our students come from all over. It was, this picture is taken, of course, during the time of COVID, and some of our students didn't care if they got COVID, and some didn't want COVID, but most did not want chin COVID. Chin COVID is very, very bad, you know, and you can still want it on your chin. So, anyway. That was the joke we had going on, because I could not get the students to keep their face masks on. Of course, you couldn't get the instructors to keep our face masks either when we were lecture, lecturing for hours at a time. <clears throat> but my call, um, I thought, when I was going there was to just simply teach, okay? My background uh, is in biblical languages. I thought I was going to go there and teach Hebrew, some Greek, teach biblical courses. And indeed, a, a large <coughs> portion of what I do is that. I do teaching. Um, and this building here is a building that was um, built in conjunction with LCMS and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Kenya, our sister church body, to provide a lecture hall that can hold 40 students, which is a real blessing to have. Uh, especially many of our introductory courses have large class, classes of students, and when it comes to testing, you want to spread students out so they're not helping each other. Um, and so there. But lo and behold, when I got there, I find out that they want to be, be, be the dean of curriculum, which effectively is an academic dean. So that's the work I do. I work alongside of Principal Thomas Omolo, who is the, basically the, the head of the school there. Um, our faculty is made up of two LCMS missionaries and then four Kenyan faculty. It is a school of our sister church body, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Kenya. It is not controlled by the LCMS. But we are there to provide assistance, to be there and fill in the gaps that they can't fill in themselves. But beyond that also, there's the desire to have this aspect of our fellowship and the gospel demonstrated by having a faculty that is representative not just of one group, and therefore, our four Kenyan faculty are also from different tribes. 
which is also very helpful because the school then does not become identified as a Kisi school or a Luo school or a Maasai school or anything like that. It is the school of the church body in Kenya. Um, and then this area back over here is where my office is as I serve as the dean. And um, every time I close the door to get some work done, I get a knock on the door from a student. Uh, and I just open the door and we have a good time getting to know one another and to answer some of their questions. Now, part of the challenges that we are facing in Africa is the encroachment of a lot of the issues that we find here in the West. Um, and that is brought in by groups that have money, right? They come in with the money, they promise the money, and then that is supposed to entice people to go ahead and be well, change your theology a little bit, right? Um, the Lutheran World Federation is one of such groups that does that. Uh, they're very much funded by the ELCA and other groups like that. And so there's a push by them for the homosexual agenda and even for the push for the issue of abortion, which is very much against the, uh, the faith, but also against the cultural norms of the people. So. In this uh, video clip here, um, I'm teaching the students from the book of Luke. And this is the story where Elizabeth, who is pregnant, is visited by Mary, who is also pregnant. And my question is, how many people, how many persons are in the room? And, um, and we'll just hear some of what I had to say. Sorry. Five is not a The child Mary is born to be. And the the Lord, right? The Lord. So there's she knows who it is in Mary's womb. I always like to ask when I'm talking to people about this, how many people are in the room? There's Elizabeth and Mary. There's John in Elizabeth's womb. And there's Jesus in Elizabeth's Mary's womb. So we have the four. And so, and there we see that this child leaps for joy. She says, Behold, the sound of your greeting came to my ears. The baby in my womb leaped for joy. That's a human reaction, isn't it? That's a person reacting. So John the Baptist here is already acknowledging who Jesus is. In the womb of Mary, it's basically about. So again, what we try to do often in our teaching is, I'm not an expert in their culture, right? My PhD is in theology and culture, but I'm not an expert on East African culture, which there is a commonality to, and then there's all the various <coughs> aspects of the various cultures. What we do, though, is we have a discussion based upon what the Bible teaches, and then have them wrestle with it in terms of their own cultural setting. So here, the, the fact that's being presented is that man, uh, if, if you believe what the Bible says, Elizabeth says that the baby leaped for joy. joy. It wasn't just a wiggle of a whatever, right? And so then what is the implications of this? The discussion goes on, and, and that's the kind of conversations that we often have in the classroom and then after, after class as well. I want to tell you a little bit, though, about a certain man that I have really grown to love. And this man here is... Kelvin Lenasayam. Kelvin lives among the Samburu people. He is Samburu himself. Um, you've heard of the Maasai. They're probably the most famous group in Kenya. And the Maasai are the ones that can jump really high without bending their knees, right? They're also cattlemen, right? So they probably belong in Wyoming. Um, but the Samburu are related, but their wealth is in camels. Uh, and Kelvin actually had one camel. The, a lion got it while he was at seminary. Oh. And so he lost, basically, <coughs> the only thing he had of any value um, 
These are not Kelvin's camels. He just wanted us to make sure we saw some camels when we went up there. And this visit was during his um, internship. Now, Kelvin also wanted us to go to the grave of his father. Kelvin's father, uh, father is buried here under this tree. And Kelvin's father is a polygamist. He had numerous wives. In Kenya, polygamy is legal. It's not legal for Christians. You can only have one wife, because the Bible says that. The Constitution is based upon this. Yeah. Muslims can have four wives, and traditionalists can have as many wives as they can afford, which usually isn't four. Um, but Kelvin's father, before he became a Christian, had multiple wives. And this is not his mother, it's one of his mothers. His biological mother has passed away. And we assume that these are some of her grandchildren, that her daughter is probably off somewhere earning some fun, some money. They live up in the northern <coughs> area. The Samburu people are known, the women especially, for these beaded necklaces, I guess you would call them, around the neck. Beautiful uh, work, and also being like elongated ears with the earrings and things like that. Now people often ask about the hair. It's very common in Africa for the women to have very short hair. Part of it, it grows very, very thick, and... It's really a hygiene issue. Um, when your only water is a muddy river or the drain, drain from the side of the road, that's how they can maintain um, yeah. some degree of cleanliness. And the, and the girls and the boys, when they go off to school, are almost always have no hair on the head for that very same reason. It's just... In boarding schools, yeah. you'll see, especially, yeah. to uh -huh. maintain hygiene. Yes, I had a lot of people ask, but those boys are girls, those are girls. You can tell they have skirts on. Um, so, uh, Kelvin uh, did very, very well on his internship. When we went up there, we brought communion because they had not had communion in well over six months. And no pastor serving them up there. And so we went up with another missionary and we were able to do that uh, for them. Uh, but Kelvin did very well and he came back for continuing education to earn his diploma in theology. And he, he graduated with a 3.9 out of a 4.0. Oh, wow. Now, one congregation had gifted me with, well, they didn't gift me, they said, get this thing to Africa, to a congregation that needs it. So I couldn't think of a more, um, a more deserving guy than Kelvin. Well, Kelvin is ord gets ordained, and Kelvin goes up to serve in his congregation up there. Um, most pastors in Africa have a congregation of, oh, about, uh, well, a, a parish of about five or more congregations that they serve. So he has quite a circuit that he runs through. Um, well, Kelvin contacted me one day. He says, I got great news for you, Doctor, uh, Doctari. He said, we had baptism uh, on this past Sunday. I had 44 bapt <laughs> baptized in the river. And I have 37 in adult instruction. So that was so good to hear. And uh, so we, we, him, I said, send me some pictures. You know, this is wonderful. And he continues to serve up there. News we got from them just past week, Kelvin now is married. So that must mean he must have a, uh, a camel or two. Uh, I know he needed to get, I forgot how many goats his wife cost him. Uh, whoa, he's telling me about that. Um, that's important. Uh, we also have been among the Maasai people. Uh, what happened? It's not following me. Okay. It's not, I'm not getting into advance there. There we go. All right, among the Maasai. And uh, here is a little bit more about the cultural setting. This man here is Maasai. He is preaching. Now in this congregation where he is, uh, the Maasai and the Kisi people worship together, which is unusual. And so he is preaching in Ma, their language, and his elder is translating from Ma into Ekagusi, the language of the people there. Uh, this is Jacqueline, another deaconess that we know. Uh, she asked us to get her a Bible in her language, which is Luo, so she could do a women's Bible study. And we had the, the joy and privilege to be able... Presenting again. Lagging. Now, there we go. Um, to be able to go and watch her during her internship. Uh, this is her supervising pastor. 
And, the, um, and uh, this is their congregation where they worship. They built it themselves. You can see by size, it's about two chairs wide on either side with another aisle in the middle. So I'd say maybe six by 12 or something like that. Um, but they built it themselves. Who's and the pastor there? Hmm? Who's the pastor there? Um, pastor Vincent? Vincent, yeah. yeah. Maybe Victor? <laughs> He's a younger guy here. <clears throat> They're down by the lake. Okay, I don't even like oh. um, this is on our back porch. Um, this is another deaconess student. Her name is Helen. And she came from a polygamy family as well. But they have, as part of the deaconess training, they do get the theological training, the um, Book of Concord and some book studies and things like that. But they also have some practical classes. And this is related to the Home Ec 1 class. Um, and their assignment is to write a business plan. They um, often have to support themselves. They don't get any financial reimbursement. And so they get a little bit of information about how to get some funds of their own on the side. And they learn some sewing um, and some different things, but part of it is a business plan. I'm a registered dietitian and had had um, pra private practice at some point. And so she had come down to get some information and some guidance on putting together a business plan. They do have a Home Ec 2 class as well. And as of next spring, they've reoriented the course curriculum to include a lot of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So they've asked me to do that class as well. So um, <coughs> I, I will be on the learning curve for that one. <laughs> I, I know the nutrition part, but putting into a semester class will be new for me. <laughs> we'll also have the challenges of, of her developing her work permit and things like that as well. So please pray for her on that situation. If we were volunteers <coughs> coming in, it wouldn't be an issue. But since we're residents there of Kenya, uh, if you want to work even without pay, you have to have a work permit. So that's a challenge that we have. In fact, even my work permit is processing through right now. It's good for about three years. So I have a green card. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we often go out and I go out to the villages and, and preach. Uh, this is one of the chances. And of course, when that happens, we always have uh, lots of singing that takes place. <laughs> take a few minutes to talk about an important project that we're involved in. Um, the typical LCMS seminarian <coughs> leaving the seminary for his first call has a vehicle with a few personal belongings and a Mack truck behind him with his library. <laughs> right? I, I'm over exaggerating, but most of us have a pretty significant library of theological books, and we're blessed in this country with the ability to access these things. That's not true in most of the world. Uh, West Africa has a challenge with books, and that is it is so wet there, they tend to rot. East Africa doesn't really have that issue, but still, they're not so available. So, my, when I get back in August, I'll be teaching Greek uh, for the first year to the students that are there. And then their beginning of their second year, they will take their first Greek language based New Testament course, probably on the Gospels or one of the epistles. Upon complete, successful completion of their uh, Greek language based Bible course, they will earn a reader's edition Greek New Testament. And that is funded uh, thanks to uh, many contributors here in the United States that understand the importance of that uh, project. Uh, the second year, they begin Biblical Hebrew. And so after they complete that course, and, and they successfully complete a Hebrew-based course on the book of Isaiah, the prophet, then they earn a Hebrew Reader's Edition Old Testament. 
And the advantage of these two books is they have in them not only the text of the Bible, but also the grammatical tables and things and dictionary all in one package so that they can bring it with them. Then our students, I also teach Lutheran Confessions, so the Book of Concord over a two semester span. And when they graduate from the seminary and are sent out to be pastors, they receive, they have earned a copy of the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, which you see here. Um, and this is a, one student, Olivier, who, who is receiving it, but he is with a, a number of other students of his. These are five men who are finishing their Bachelor of Theology program at the school right now. And I like this picture for a couple of reasons. It shows you again the diversity of our students. Mungu here, he is from, uh, Mugo, excuse me, he is from the Mount Kenya area, uh, which is north of Nairobi. He's Kenyan. Uh, this is Fred. Fred is from Tanzania. Uh, and this is Gabriel. He is from Burundi. He is not a native uh, English speaker at all. The, he's from Francophone Africa, but he's very, very good in his English, and he's done very, very well. I'd love to see him come back for a master's program. This is Olivier over here that you saw earlier. He is from Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, and this here, and Rwanda is transitioned from being French speaking to becoming English speaking, again, because of the changes in the world. <coughs> this is Alicia. You call him Elisha in English. Uh, Elisha is from way south in Tanzania. Now, Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania, we are not in fellowship with that church body. In fact, many of their dioceses are quite liberal. And so is his diocese. Um, when I have begin my course on the, on, the book, on the Book of Concord, I always ask him this question. How many of you believe that what the Book of Concord teaches is consistent with what the Bible says? And all the hands go up. And I say, put your hands down. You haven't studied it yet. Because I want them to understand what the scriptures teach and that our confessions are based on what the Holy Scripture teaches. The Book of Concord is not a paper pope. It simply is a confession based upon what the Bible actually teaches. So we get deeply into the scriptures and then see that the confessions are teaching that very same thing. I asked the question, Alicia's hand did not go up. And I thought, this could be good. And it was. Because Alicia said, you'll need to show it to me. Well, about a month before uh, the end of one of the semesters, he comes up to me and says, how many copies of the Swahili Book of Concord can you get me? I need to take these down there because we need to study it with the scriptures. I said, Alicia, we'll see what we can do. <coughs> these are some of the other men in the diploma program who are receiving their uh, Hebrew Bibles. And again, these men are from various countries. This man is actually from South Sudan. Uh, so a number of different men from all over the place. So, so is he. He's from Sudan as well. And we also make sure that we provide uh, books for the library. This is Vivian. Vivian uh, came to us to work in the library and uh, just a couple, about a month ago I would say now, she was finally confirmed uh, in, in the faith. Uh, I, I live in Kenya, but I don't only teach there. I was asked to come down to South Africa and teach. There is, uh, South Africa is there to the south. And um, we went to uh, Shwane, which is uh, known better as Pretoria, which is where the seminary for the uh, three uh, Lutheran uh, church bodies that are in uh, South Africa are located. I had a chance to preach during that chapel service and also to, uh, to teach. I was teaching on uh, the book of First Peter primarily, uh, a section called the General Epistles. And then also the joy of being able to talk to the students, which is always love to do. Um, not just there, but everywhere. It's always good to sit down with the students and just have a really good discussion. And we were doing that, and Robin walked by and said, I got a snack picture of this for you. Uh, so we're off of that. Talking about pictures, at the end of class, they always like to have their pictures taken. Um, and I got a chance to sit right, stand right next to Martin Luther. And that's what that's all the students called him. It was kind of a nickname. Tanzania is one of the areas I've very much been involved in, especially recently. Uh, I was asked uh, to go down there to teach in a continuing education course. 
Uh, again, Tanzania is located just south of, of Kenya. And where we went, again, our same map from before, there's Nairobi. This was Iringa. Where we live is about here. And so I went down to a town called Shinyanga, which is right here. Um, and while I was there, I was teaching on a course. Now, just imagine this. You have one week to teach Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. <laughs> and you have a second week to teach Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. <laughs> yeah, that's the reaction. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't do that yet. So I was, uh, I said, absolutely no way. You can do, cannot do that. So I restructured the course with the idea of let's look at Christ in the Old Testament. Especially Christ in Genesis and Exodus, and then in Isaiah. Some key passages. That's where we really emphasized it. It was fascinating because they said, you know, I've always just looked at the Old Testament as being old history. Never quite realized that you could preach Christ from the Old Testament. I said, you can? So where? So like, well, like the lamb, the Passover lamb, right? And then someone said, well, yeah, John the Baptist. John the Baptist says Christ is the Lamb of God that <coughs> takes away the sin of the world. And then someone else says, we sing about that in the liturgy. And I said, you do? <laughs> and they said, yes, we do. Where's that? They look at me like I'm the stupidest guy in the world. <laughs> they start singing it. But they start singing it in Swahili. I told them, you got to stop. Because I need to record this. This is them singing in Swahili, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You know, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, which is the hymn of mercy. And grant us your peace. And it's absolutely beautiful. I like it better than the English. Because it is slow and meditative. <laughs> oh, by the way, it does start off with a one and a two. time to be there with them and to teach. That teaching there was done. It was a, it was a Swahili based course that we were teaching at that point. And of course, after the singing, we have to take an exam. And they all passed. <laughs> this is a little example of how they fed them down there. A couple of ladies here cooking up a, a pot of beans. And then, of course, after the course, uh, whoop, the obligatory picture of the students uh, together. We had a, a really good time. Uh, I work down there, down Tanzania has really changed. I told you, I thought I was going to become, just going there to teach. Then I find out I'm gonna be the academic dean. Well, more recently I've been asked to help uh, spearhead a development of a new seminary in Shinyanga, Tanzania. The Evangelical Lutheran Church of Tanzania, we are not in fellowship with, but it does have dioceses that are actually very strong, including the southeast of Lake Victoria Diocese, um, which is uh, now uh, their, their bishop is Bishop Yohan Nzelu, uh, who is becoming a very good friend. Uh, we are discussing their work on the new seminary. Rob and I had a chance to go down there and spend, uh, spend some time. Uh, Nzelu has just recently been installed as their second bishop of that uh, diocese. Um, and meeting together with their faculty, in this case discussing curriculum. 
When you develop a new seminary, there's three important parts that you work on. One is curriculum development, and it has two parts. To be faithful scripturally, and to be culturally relevant. The cultural relevancy, that's not my expertise, but I'm learning a lot about it, but that's what those men help with. But in terms of the faithfulness to the scripture and the confessions, that's a lot of what I do in conjunction with the International Lutheran Council as well. The second part is faculty development, and he's committed to seeing these men who are going to be his instructors uh, receive their master's degrees in theology. Most of them are coming, uh, being sent to one of our seminaries here in the United States. And the third part uh, of any kind of project like this is the area of facilities. And we are currently working with them for, the, for a 24-man dormitory and also a classroom with the goal next year of having 24 students begin the program, the following year another 24, the following year another 24. Costs uh, are much lower for them to have it in Tanzania than to be sending the students up to Matongo. So again, the work of missions is often uh, very varied. You think you're going to go do one thing, and you find out they're going to be doing another. Um, while we were in St. Louis, they're even talking possibly about curriculum development in other areas throughout our regions. Our missionaries serve in four general uh, uh, areas. We have our Latin America Caribbean, Caribbean group, which is like it sounds. Um, and we have also our Eurasia group, which is Europe and Eastern Europe. We have our Asia region, which is very large and varied. And then we have our Africa region, uh, which has recently come together as one. We were divided east and west for a long time. Um, and so uh, most of our missionaries, though, are in East Africa. Uh, we just have one family in West Africa at this time uh, that is serving full time. So uh, definitely thank you for the opportunity to tell you about the mission that the Lord has called us to do. Uh, we say Asante in Swahili, which means thank you. Um, and these uh, represent some of the various languages that are spoken on the continent. Um, it's a very, very continent, and it's a real joy uh, to be able to serve the Lord there. Um, if you would like to get any more information about it, we have some cards that are on that table over there and some newsletters. And if we do send out a basically a monthly newsletter, I'll admit we usually get 10 months out of the year. Um, but if you were interested in just receiving it to be able to pray intelligently for us, um, then we, you have a book over there, right? Yeah. Uh, we send it out both electronically and by snail mail, whichever you prefer. Um, yeah, the old old-fashioned way still works. Um, so, and any questions or I'm happy to answer. I just yes. have a question. I used to have friends, well, there's, they still are alive. They are now in Nebraska, Winnebago tribe they serve. Uh -huh. uh, but they were in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. and they were taken away out of there. Is anything happening in Sierra Leone now? We are working closely with them there. there we had missionaries in Sierra Leone okay. up until recently, but they returned to the United yeah. States. Yeah. There has been unrest in that area. Yes. There's a lot of unrest in East Africa, uh, West Africa overall. Um, we used to have a lot of work in Togo and a lot of work in Nigeria. Um, we do support a, 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 a seminary in Nigeria um, for the Nigerian uh, Lutheran Church of Nigeria, LCN. Um, but it is completely run by them. We no longer have a missionary there due to the issues in the country. When they had to go, they had to go. Yes. I mean, it was... Oh, it was, no. yeah, it was a very quick evacuation yes. of the area. They had to. That yeah. has happened. Uh, and for our safety, the LCMS does employ a man who's actually got a lot of background in security <laughs> matters. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we are always packed and ready to go if there is any issue. Um, where we live, we consider ourselves actually quite safe of all the countries. I think Kenya is probably one of the most secure and settled yeah. of all of them. I just wondered if that, if that work can pick yeah. up again. We, we have, we're still working with the church body. We okay. have a lot where we don't have missionaries, but we're still working with the church bodies themselves. And again, we're always there as guests of the church body. If they want missionaries, great. If they don't, there's other ways that we partner. Yeah. Um, and so, Kenya wants to have an international faculty, so even if they had all the people they needed, I think they would still like to have one of us there. 
um, to maintain the connections between our church bodies. Uh, just like we have uh, in our in our seminaries, we have a job in well, Fort Wayne. We have a guy from Japan, a guy from Germany, and a guy from South Africa. Uh, so we have varied faculties ourselves, and it really kind of expresses the the, the, the universality of the yeah. church. When does your second service start? I think it's pretty soon. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen. Yeah. I just wanted, didn't want us to interrupt anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, again, you. there's information on the table if you'd like to get some, but we certainly appreciate your prayers um, as we continue to serve the Lord. A lot of people are asking, well, when are you, when are you going back? Um, we are extending through convention, uh, so we will still be here through August in, well, in the United States. And then um, we will be heading back, uh, continuing to serve for as long as the Lord has us there, which we see kind of as indefinite. So, no end time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.